Um, how are you? I think you are still muted. Sorry. No problem. What a pleasure to welcome you. you. I just want to welcome everyone also at home because we are live, of course, and uh, welcome everyone to At Home on Art and Cultural Heritage, an artist talk with Jan Vo. So it's one of these uh, multi-continental events where the artist is actually in Berlin, if I'm right, but I'm going to ask him in a second from now. And myself, I am in Zurich, Switzerland, my hometown right now. And probably a lot of you are on the US continent, maybe in the Washington DC area or even New York, or maybe on the, on the West Coast. So good morning to the West Coast. And it's a great pleasure to have these artist talks. I was always very hesitant if anything could happen through Zoom. But I must say, I believe it can. It's, it's a valid form of exchange for now. And I really think we have to embrace it. And I'm so happy that you accepted the Hirschhorn's invitation to be with us. Of course, you don't need a lot of introduction because I think you're one of the artists who definitely created headlines, who created visionary artworks I mean, uh, I don't think that a lot of people who are interested in contemporary art were able to miss out on We the People, your uh, piece by piece reconstruction of the Statue of Liberty. But that was, of course, never assembled, but rather that remained until this day the, one of the largest fragmented artworks that one can imagine. But I just want to to add a little bit of information. So your work is always uh, makes very often use of powerful fragments, fragments of objects and fragments of stories. You explore issues of self identity and cultural heritage and your early experiences of fleeing political tensions in Vietnam, I think at age four, where you boarded a, a self-made vessel or raft to uh, escape Vietnam with the vision of a better future. And you were four years old, I think it was in 1979. And the whole assimilation to European culture, which eventually you ended up in Denmark. And that was a, a pure coincidence because it was actually a freight ship that uh, saved you from uh, the, the risk and dangers of of the waters, the open waters, and that brought you to Denmark. But all, of course, uh, your whole life history has left a lasting impression on you, but also on your work. But I think it's also very interesting to speak about this issue with you. I remember as an art history student in Zurich, there were always red flags where our professor would say, don't synchronize the, the work with the life. This is not the same. Like one is, is maybe uh, has some, some factual information that take place. And the other one also has a fictional potential that can unfold. And it's very difficult, or maybe you shouldn't tell apart those two layers, but I'm sure that this is gonna be an issue we're gonna speak about. You often display fragments of objects and documents that represent Western values to create emotionally and symbolically charged sculptures that explore how meaning changes with context. Another work that is exemplary and unforgettable is uh, your contribution to the Venice Biennial that Massimiano Gioni curated the Encyclopedic Palace, where you basically undict a 200 year old Catholic church from Vietnam and that you exhibited in the context of contemporary art and of this institution of the biennial. But this won't be the work that we're going to look into. Actually, we had a preparatory talk last week and you were so uh, generous to, to give me a choice. And uh, I picked four works that I'm really interested in also because they have a certain ambivalence and they create a lot of interesting questions around your work. Just to say a couple of uh, details about your life and your success. 
So your works have been exhibited worldwide at institutions, including the South London Gallery, the Guggenheim in New York, where you had an amazing solo show, the States Museum for, uh, for Kunst in Copenhagen, the M Plus Museum in Hong Kong, the CRPC Musée d'Art Contemporain in Bordeaux, and you also showed at the Aspen Art Museum, the Ludwig Museum, Palacio de Cristal, Reina Sofia in Madrid, Museo Jumex in Mexico City, the Kitchen in New York, Musée d'Art Moderne de la Ville de Paris, and so on. You won the prestigious Arkan Art Prize in 2015, the Hugo Boss Prize from the Guggenheim Foundation in 2013, and the Blau Orange Prize in Berlin in 2007. You represented Denmark at the 2015 Venice Biennial, and you were included in the 2019 and the 2013 editions of the Venice Biennials, the Berlin Biennials in 2014 and 2010, the Singapore Biennial in 2011, and the Guangzhou Biennial, South Korea in 2010, but also the actual edition. And I'm also, I remember also your years in Basel, I think Basel, Switzerland was quite an important kind of another hometown, maybe. And maybe we can start with this common ground and what brought you to Basel and what, what the repercussions were of this longer stay you had. Yeah, no, Basel was always, uh, it was very professional. You know, I started like one of the earliest um, uh, yeah, I think it was probably the first fair or something. So I did the statement and then I did, uh, I think I think I basically did everything, right? Unlimited, parkour. And uh, I had one of the most amazing experience with Adam Chimchek at the um, Kunsthalle. And then I also like had this one year residency at the Lorenz house. So I, I befriended like really good uh, people and uh, I learned to ski and uh, it was a kind of second home, no? Especially in a in a period where I was traveling extensively. So Basel was this quiet, professional place with very good people, very good museums, and um, and it just became a very um, first of all professional uh, city for me. But uh, but uh, I can return any time back, and it feels a little bit like home. It's nice to have a flashback of the years we were still traveling and we were able to explore the world. I mean, you still have two uh, places of residence. You are right now in Berlin and uh, Berlin has become, and everybody thinks probably that you are living in a loft in Berlin Mitte and that you are befriending all these artists and that, that you have maybe a limited social life, but still. But I mean, for those who have watched uh, the excellent videos that the Louisiana Museum in Humlebeck, Denmark has made, there's a very touching portrait of this garden with surrounding buildings, but it really seems that you are living in a garden with some sheltering opportunities. And yeah. I would love to hear more about your vision for this garden and how it came about. So uh, I think the best choices is when you don't predict them. No? You, uh, I mean, I, I actually started with, have, was interested in building like an archive and uh, it was uh, Rick Ritt, that bastard. No? He was like, young, we should do it together. And then, you know, why don't we do it in the countryside? And at the time he had a German girlfriend and they, and he was like, then we have like a countryside place too, you know. And I thought it was a good idea. I'm a, he's my mentor, so I do anything for Rigrid. And uh, then he didn't have a German girlfriend anymore. And I never saw him again. And then I was sitting there with this countryside place. And if you met me three years ago, three and a half years ago, I would be afraid of rainworms, no? I'm a very practical guy. so. The building that we bought, uh, there was some land adjoined. So uh, I, I thought, you know, like maybe I should do a vegetable garden and I hired like a part-time gardener to, to do that. And then one thing takes the other, no? And then suddenly now I'm totally merged with, with uh, thinking of gardens. And I, I, it's just very new for me, but, uh, but I think it fitted very well, like in terms of where I am in my uh, career, but also in age. And 
And uh, I think I've been work damaged, you know, like we have, as an artist, like, um, done all these kind of uh, effort for doing exhibitions that last for a month. And then if we're lucky, two months, and if we're very lucky, like a little bit longer, but they disappear again, you know? So suddenly discovering a garden where you actually get to think that in next year it's going to be even better. And in five years, it's going to be even better. Or it can also be, you know, go back and forth, but then it has a total another time span, which I, I think was just the right moment for me to, um, to engage with. And uh, somebody should have told me that it's a full-time job to have a garden and, and, and that a garden is a travel in itself. So if I have like to go away for a month or two, which I usually would do before, uh, I miss the development of the season, no? And, uh, and uh, I don't know how to deal with that in the future, but uh, I will. But can you describe a little bit your, your gardening philosophy? Is it, is it like very, very, because you say you have to intervene, you have to, to cut down probably certain plants, you have to nurture them, you have to make sure that they get all what they need and so on. But how much can you just let happen? No, I can, I mean, there's different steer? parts. I mean, I think at the moment it's a learning process and it has been a learning process the last three and a half year. But, uh, and one you know, like I, I discovered, you know, like these 50 birds that singing out of, outside of the window that I don't know 90% of the names of the birds. I don't know like the names of the flowers that I see around, but I know like all these shitty names of museum directors and artists and whatever, you know. So I think that what I found like also a kind of unbalance in the way that, uh, that I understood life in general. And, and, and for me, it's just like a new journey. So it's like a, your unexplored continent that you are about to dive in. Yeah, yeah, a kind of. That's great. You mentioned Rikri Tiravanit, and I, I think it's really interesting to hear you say that he's a mentor of yours, because of course there are certain maybe similar interests that you have. I mean, Rikri being the son of a diplomat, being born in in Argentina, in Buenos Aires, but as a Thai citizen, then going to school in the United States or going to art school in the United States and ending up in the New York art scene in the early 90s. And eventually, of course, developing a work that elegantly creates also kind of, I mean, in his, uh, in his work really makes sense to use this verb of digesting, but of digesting cultural identities, you know, and to play around with different notions of what a cultural identity is nowadays. Yeah. Where you, like, how did that influence happen? I mean, he was, to my knowledge, he was never your teacher at the Städel Schule in Frankfurt. No, no, it? it was actually already in Denmark because remember Rick, Rick, he didn't earn money in the 2000s. I mean, he was doing all these crazy performative work no? and cooking a lot. So he actually lived mostly from teaching. So when I, when he was guest professor in Denmark, I think he had like four professorships or something. I remember sometimes it was so chaotic because he was, all, he was teaching in, in Stadel and he was teaching in Bergen and he was teaching in Copenhagen. And of course he didn't have time for all this. So he just bunched all of the students together. No? And then, uh, so it was just like, but that was my first introduction for any kind of resampling of internationalism. No? So I met like a lot of students from different places around the world. And he was always so generous that, you know, he would you know, exhibit around somewhere and then he would pick up like a student from Brazil, from Thailand, from wherever. And then they, they were all just bunched together. No? But, um, and, so, uh, so. and uh, that, that, you know, like he was, he's just like, uh, he's just the best. So it was kind of this ideal teaching of, of just being a role model, how to, to take the weight with elegance to be an artist and to be a role model just by living it 
Uh, yeah, because I think it's very difficult to teach art, no? I mean, I think, uh, it is, you know, like one of the best sentences I learned from any teacher was probably from him, where he says, you know, like, oh, you, as, an art, as a student, you can only concentrate on your artwork because if there's something to pick up, there's tons of professionals and they have very sharp eyes. They will find you. And, uh, and I think his teaching is also, I mean, and it is a part of his art practice. It's not different from when he arranged like these situations in different uh, exhibitions and uh, where um, he, he creates like a, a platform for people to engage in whether, you know, whatever happens out of it. No? And that, that is the uh, platforms where you can engage and you can drag whatever you want out of it. So one thing that I want to ask you, maybe also in, in connection with, uh, with Recreate, I mean, Recreate became um, a US Thai artist and, but you, you, also had like kind of a very deep fascination for US culture. And I mean, this, I think we should dive in into the first work that I selected. So Rebecca, if you could hand us over the slideshow, thank you very much. So this work from 2006, if you were to climb the Himalayas tomorrow, that at, you showed in several locations, you showed it at the Stedelijk Museum in Amsterdam, for your solo show, but it was of course also part of your uh, large retrospective at the Guggenheim. And uh, I mean, the work consists as the caption says, yes, that's an, an image actually where we saw, where we see the, the, wall, the wall vitrine with the light where this was exhibited as basically encased within the wall. And so, what, what I thought was really interesting in your work is that you are able to revive or to give the ready-made another round of, of vividness and of relevance. Although, I mean, one could believe that so, after so many years, after over hundred years of actually having the ready-made within contemporary art, as, as an important uh, vehicle that it's, it might be very difficult, you know, to bring in a concise message and to load it with, a, with an interesting identity or an, an, a narrative that really functions as something that you own and that you can steer as an artist. Maybe we can go back to the first slide where we see actually the three artifacts that are a part of this work. It's a, a Dupont lighter, which I think was crafted by Cartier, is that right? Yeah. By the case, and we have in the middle a ring, an American military class ring. Mm. And on the right side, we have a, a Rolex. And what, what I think is really interesting is that how you are able to bring up like a narrative that could trigger some stereotypes, but then actually goes against the grain of those stereotypes because nothing is really what it seems to be. Maybe I can give you more hints, but you, I, I believe like in, in the, the first time I encountered this work, that it really was something that your father brought from Vietnam and that it might have been in conjunction with his former life. But I thought it was even more interesting that he acquired these objects in, in his new uh, country of residence in Denmark, and that those were like objects he was longing for to own, to call his own and, and to have around him. And then actually there's the second layer of you and your perception of these objects as the objects of your father. And maybe you can tell a little bit more like how you come about, like how you are able to unfold these narrative structures and how you, you discover them. Okay. So I, I think these early pieces, no, it all came from this idea that, uh, that uh, you know, like I, 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 as a student, I was actually watching much more films and I was obsessed with films. Um, and it created like this, you know, like a way of thinking time, you know? 
but uh, I knew that I didn't have capacity of being a film director or whatever. So I, as a very practical person, uh, I was trying to analyze if I'm gonna become an artist, what space is it that I'm gonna um, work in mostly? And that would be the confinement of the white cube no? and the white walls. And uh, in my practical mind, I always thought, okay, what is the quality of uh, of that space? How do you how do you enhance like the quality of such a space? And as we all know that it was designed to amputate meaning, right? I thought, okay, that's what I'm gonna use it to like to enforce this idea that whatever you put in a Y cube, it amputates like the meaning of life attached to it. And I wanted to make use of that because I I never believed that art was a uh, um, was a channel to bridge uh, communication. I thought if we want to deal with reality, we have to confront what that reality means. And I think reality for me is like the disconnection between me and you, you know, me and a, a homeless pe person I see in, in the city that I don't even think a second of, you know. So I wanted to work with this idea that, that how does a society work together in, in, in the disconnection that actually exists in, in any uh, society. And that was what I wanted to do. I wanted like to use these objects that was almost a mirror of what we see daily, you know, but with amputated meaning. And I thought that was, if we need any kind of discussion in order to make this place a little better place to live in, we have to confront the essential problem the disconnection between people, right? And, and that was a serious, uh, and you have to remember at that time, you know, like I, I didn't, I think the, the caption you see there, that was how I did my captions, you know, like it was not additional interpretation or anything. It was just like very um, short uh, information of what it, 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 what it was for me, you know? And the, uh, I, you know, like, I, I think it was also very early in my career. So that was what I was uh, a kind of obsessed with. But I think looking back, I, I, I think I can formulate it a little bit more clear in the sense that, the, and it's actually even within the last three, two months or something, that I think in my work, I always have been against this desire, inner desire that we think we, it, comes from within, but of course it's not. It's brought up by ideologies, capitalism, whatever. I mean, why would we like uh, to have roses instead of uh, violets, no? I mean, what creates these kind of different uh, uh, desires? And, and recently I thought of it, you know, I think desires are in a way my worst enemy because, uh, First of all, I don't think it belongs to ourselves, but the main reason that I never could formulate before is that desires kills curiosity. Because if you love something, it's very difficult to look at something else. No? And, uh, and I think that that is as simple as that, that I, I, I'm interested in what desires are for people. And, and this is of course what I, do when I look at my father, we grew up like, you know, super poor. We didn't have like, I mean, <laughs> we didn't have any money. You know? And he would always sit with his gold, <laughs> golden things, you know? And then he, uh, he blamed me for being too effeminate, you no? Know? <laughs> and I was always looking at these kind of jewelries that he was wearing, you know? So I wonder like, if, for me, it was like to dive into to his desires in order to also to understand that you know, the difference between me and him. And, and, and it, it, many of the works I'm doing, it is actually for my own understanding of diving into something, you know? And this was really a kind of also trying to get to understand my, my father better. I mean, you know, like, uh, he, I think he had like some goal left over because he organized like the, the escape. So, so he was collecting, the gold from other people. So he had like a little bit left over or something. So in the refugee camp, he would buy the Rolex, no? he would buy the lighter and the military ring came later. 
because he escaped like the military. He, he faked like his age and stuff like this. So he was never in the military in Vietnam. But of course, like in Vietnam, like the, the uh, if any Vietnamese would wear like a military class ring, that would mean that either they came from a very rich family or they were very intelligent because then they could be sent abroad to study. You know? and, uh, and that became a status symbol. And so for me, it's, it's, it was like really like trying to, to, to cope with these information and, and, and work with it. So if we look a little bit more deep into, into this professional relationship that you have established with your father, which I believe is, is absolutely unique. I mean, you, this is a, an early example, but later you hired him actually as a, as a skillful worker to execute the gold leaf work. Or well, there's another uh, work that has become quite notorious where he copies a letter in an open edition that, was, uh, that is related actually to missionary, a missionary man in Vietnam that himself was condemned uh, to death and wrote a last letter to his father. So you're reflecting a lot the, this relationship of father and son. And I mean, I, I, I mentioned that I think any synchronization of work and life, I think, is, is a risk because of course, any artwork is a fictional construction. It's, it's a narrative that is created, that is full of ambivalence. But can you tell us a little bit more like how this professional relationship with your father came about from first borrowing uh, personal items to then uh, creating a real professional relationship? No, I think because I was mother's child. I mean, it was my mother that I was very attached to. So I started to work with my father. And, uh, you know, like, uh, it's like Louis Kahn, no? When he built it like Salt Lake City. Uh, Salt Lake Institute, he had to, he hated so much like the techno, you know, technical stuff that has to be inserted in the building. So because he hated it so much, he had to work with it. So he built it like these uh, spaces in between, you know, to deal with the problem. And I, I think, I mean, that's very inspiring for me. I think I learned about it much later, but uh, but I think it, it is comparable because I think in life you have to dive into what you what you have problems with, and uh, and uh, I think that also relates to the idea of desire. You know? Like you 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 work with what is problem for you, and that was not only like uh, he was a kind of uh, image for me as a as the cultural difference, no, but also like uh, as the um, as uh, as the masculine opposite of me too. So there was all these elements that I, I thought he was a, a great like uh, figure that could be my my very obscure the very obscure mirror of myself. You know? And uh, of so we started to engage in these kind of things. And and um, it's true that uh, we never really talked. Like also there was language barriers and all these kind of stuff. And, uh, and then, you know, then he started to call me a lot. So I had to hire a person just to get care of him. So I don't need him need, like to be so close. <laughs> but, uh, but that's one of the great part of the project that, uh, that it actually has um, developed our relationship, you know? like any kind of working relationship, I guess. One of the most extreme examples, I guess, is, is the gravestone that you created for your father and that was acquired, I think, by the Walker and is, is in their collection. And if I got it right, it's actually, if your father passed away, the gravestone will be transferred to uh, Copenhagen and, uh, and will become a real a gravestone. Can you say a little bit more about the concept of this work or like how the, the idea came about? 
Yeah, I think, uh, you know, like, I think uh, I, I, I was in Rome for sure and I saw like John Keats, like a uh, tombstone and it had like this beautiful epitaph like uh, that I was using. Here lies one whose name was written water. And when I saw that, I was just like, my God, so many people's name, it's, you know, like, it, it's, it just belongs to a lot of people, I think. And I thought it belonged to my father too. And it was related to uh, also my fascination of Shang Shine, you know, and he uh, had like the most, uh, I mean, I, I, I think at the time, for sure, I was very uh, interested in, in tombstones. And Sean Chene, you know, like he trained his boyfriend and the la la his last boyfriend and, and the son of the boyfriend in, in writing fake manuscripts that he would live off uh, as uh, when he was older. And uh, so the son of his latest boyfriend was uh, writing Latin, no? But uh, only in the script of uh, Sean Chene, in the handwriting of Sean Chene. So his tombstone, uh, somebody, uh, some, um, fan of uh, Chene uh, stole like the plaque that was on it, no? So he decided to engrave it himself. And it was of course a signature of Chene, you know? And uh, so I think it was a merging of these stories and things I was interested in at the time. And that then became that my father, he was um, sketching up like, like the epitaph. Um, here lies one whose name is written Water and, uh, and that was in his own handwriting. And, uh, and it's beautiful it's, it's, contextualization. So I think we have to move on. And I mean, the next work that I picked is a work, a, a later work from 2011, Theodore Kaczynski Smith Corona Portable Typewriter, which consists, of course, of the typewriter and, and uh, one, one of the pamphlets that has been written on the typewriter or a copy of it. And uh, of course, um, I guess most of people in the United States know this name. He was, uh, he's, he's probably the name in relationship to domestic terrorism in the United States and uh, he, he was hiding in a cabin in the wilderness, like almost in a, in a Walden-like scenario, like in an updated scenario of Walden and uh, eventually caught. And you had to chance, as you did in, in many other cases too, to acquire at an auction, I think the FBI auction of the typewriter and you were able to buy it and to make it your own. And I visited once uh, Cuba. It was great to be in Havana and I really liked the Museum of the Revolution. And I was really touched by the Ray-Ban, for example, different Ray-Ban models, but I remember a particular one that was owned by Che Guevara. And I was really intrigued, you know, because I was so, I, I liked the object a lot because first of all, it's a real Ray-Ban from the 1950s. And you see as an object, the way it's crafted, it's something completely different than what you see today and what Ray-Ban stands for today. And then of course, it's also like this, this aesthetic of, of the beautiful guerrilla fighter that has a sense for fashion. And it was just like collapsing in my mind, like all these different ideas of, of, uh, that would collide and that would come together. But in the, in the case of, of Kaczynski's typewriter, of course, you are to a certain degree also opening uh, a can of worms because especially in the US, it's a highly political subject. And the question is also like how to, how to remember uh, such events, you know, maybe just in the sense to prevent them to happen again and what artifacts play, what kind of role an artifact play a role. And also I like how you're able to control the narrative or to steer the narrative uh, around an object that is so strongly loaded 
with with an incident that that was quite tragic yeah, I mean, it has to be mentioned that and this was actually the first um, uh, venue where it is played like uh, one third of the Statue of Liberty. And I want to like to, I, I think also one of the, you know, like it was the, in Kassel. It was in Fredericianum in Kassel. Yeah. And, um, uh, you know, like I, I think for sure, like I was working with uh, freedom because I, I I think like experience September 11th and uh, and that you can see like the western parts of the western world going into war in the name of freedom I think then it was important to to uh, to question that then I think when these kind of things happens then one have like to not be so uh, 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 interested in freedom, which I never was really. Uh, so I want to like to have different uh, these two elements together with the, the bunch of of, uh, of uh, the Statue of Liberty that I was creating, and the newspaper you see was actually like the wedding announcement of uh, Bush, uh, Barbara, and 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 George Bush. No? Uh, no, yeah, it was Barbara and George Bush. So I wanted like to, and it's like this pretty beautiful, it was this beautiful portrait of, of um, uh, Barbara Bush uh, as a young uh, bride, no? And I wanted like these two elements to, to, uh, to, to be in the exhibition, just to, to, to um, present like the, the, the schizophrenic width of what, liberty can be determined as so that was what i did so it's almost a counterpoint to the statue of liberty within that show at the federizianum yeah yeah and then you know like it came also by mistake because it was friends of mine that was very engaged with uh, kaczynski and was in very interested in his writings and uh, and it was a crazy thing. It was the FBI that was selling out of the private property of Tsekatsinski, right? So our mission was actually uh, uh, to get like the papers and like his amazing codes were for sale and stuff. So we wanted to collect like a lot of the papers and and uh, and and um, and it's actually donated to a library today, you know? And then I couldn't help myself. I'm like a kind of auction geek, you know? So suddenly this came up and then... Uh, this came along, but it was actually the purpose of getting his papers together. But by now, those those pieces are separated, and and in different collections. I mean, the Statue of Liberty is, is anyways scattered all around the world, and the typewriter is is in which collection? Is no, I, I never sold it. I, I have it. You never it. sold it. What what is the reason? I mean, I'm sure you 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 certainly had offers, and I'm sure your galleries had an interest in selling it. Yeah, but I I, I think that was like uh, unethical. For me. I mean, I don't want like to earn money on people's disasters. Yeah, yeah. So, and I don't remember, but like at uh, at the Guggenheim, did you show the typewriter also quite close to to the Statue of Liberty to yeah. we the people? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and Barbara Bush. Yeah. With that too. Yeah. So it's a triangle of different yeah. forces and, exactly. and pillars of American culture. Yeah. So let's move on to, to another aspect of, of American culture in the white, wider sense. Uh, and, and that is also related to the Guggenheim. So if you can have the next slide, please. So Imur 2 from 2013, uh, it's also in the collection of the Walker Art Center. It's an installation of 3,935 objects that uh, belong to Martin Wong, or uh, the collection uh, set together by Martin Wong, the seminal artist who was part of the downtown, the New York downtown scene uh, of the 1980s a great painter that yet has to be uh, acknowledged, I think, on an institutional level. I think there is still kind of a, a large museum show that is due 
in the United States of this really incredible work and, and of an interpretation of painting that was very fresh and, and one of a kind and still very uh, far away from uh, neo-expressionism and of, of the figuration that became so famous in New York in the early 80s. I think he had a completely different approach that was much closer to uh, the East Village scene and to a group of artists that tried to establish a radical new art for the, the decade of the 1980s. But Imur, maybe to start with the title, Imur 2 is an appropriation too. Yeah, like, it's, uh, I, uh, you know, like he took a lot of acid, no? And he was like, a, you know, he was like wild as a child. Uh, or as a teenager, so uh, uh, it stands for I am you. Uh, I am you. You are too. That's when you take too much acid, right? It's a deviation. Was on his, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, and that was on his uh, business card, and I took that because I, I thought that was appropriate for the uh, thing, and uh, you know, like I, I think it's in life, and in, it's also in my own work. Uh, I have a philosophy that, uh, you know, if things exist in the world, then uh, I don't want to go in, in competition with it. I think it's important that you, you feel like gaps that, and cracks that, that exist in, in, in our life no? and in, in the society we live in. And uh, uh, I, you know, like Martin Wong is like for the underground uh, uh, art scene in New York, he's like, everybody knows him, everybody loves him, everybody adores him. And uh, I'm, you know, like, I'm not the one to engage in that, like the New York art scene in the 80s, and I mean, in the 90s too. So I bought like early on, like uh, a painting of his, and, and I was very much into his work. So uh, when I bought like this painting, and it's a, uh, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, it's, it's a uh, aerial view of a of a trampoline of a firemen. What do we call it? Like firemen trampoline to rescue people jumping out of the window. No? Like a tarp or something to catch people who yeah, jump yeah. from the window. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, but it was an old style. No, it was. I mean, you don't use that anymore. And uh, when I have bought it, I get like this uh, letter in the mail, and it was a. a uh, I only remember that in the letter there was like this image of a Chinese, old Chinese lady standing underneath this real thing. You know? And that I could, of course, uh, picture things together. And, and, and I've heard about Martin Wong's legendary mother. So it was the mother he had taken to the Fireman Museum in New York just before he died. You no, know? I think it's, this is like the second last paintings that he painted. And uh, and I was like, I have to meet her because this is totally, uh, you know, like this. Uh, it's, it was interesting for me. So maybe and, we can look at the photographs that you took during that visit, and that you share with us. So that's yeah. Florence Fai with the mother of Martin lamp. Wong, with the burger lamp. She would say that anything that they like, Martin and her, they, it would be a collection. No, so they like burgers. So they had like this collection of burgers in all shapes. No? So. so, so it's it's a very personal collection that reflects like his yeah, taste. Do you have some more pictures? Yeah, this is yes. the script, no? Because he was like a cali uh, cali uh, he started calligraphy before he started like uh, ceramics and art in the end. So he collected like all these kind. Of, I mean, look at the beautiful installation. No, it's like Kufic writings, and then. Like she put it together with his, uh, you know, like if you go back again, then you can see like portraits for a certain amount of money. That was his like signs he did like when he was younger and he painted people's portraits to get some money. And she would put them together with like ancient Kufic writings, ancient Sanskrit and whatever, uh, Chinese calligraphy. And it was just all like what he was actually thinking of. No? And anyhow, so when I saw her home, which was packed with all these kind of crazy stuff. I actually, uh, I was never meant to be an artwork, 
So I took like creators from MoMA, from Walker, which I already were in good dialogue with. Uh, and I told them that, you know, somebody should take care of this stuff because I think actually it's an interesting uh, combination of objects that could uh, be an interesting way of looking into Martin Wong's uh, work. No? And uh, it was Dorian Chong that was to blame because he told me, young, yeah, Martin Wong doesn't have the name big enough at the time, right? He was a little bit kind of uh, institutionally forgotten. So it was Dorian Chong who worked at MoMA at the time. He told me, "Young, yeah, this is, he's a, he's a very rational guy. No? Uh, and he told me, "Young, yeah, you know, like he doesn't have the name for a museum to take care of this stuff because that means a commitment and it means pouring a lot of uh, time money, whatever, into it. And he was trying. He was t telling me that from Martin Wong at the time was not famous enough. And he told me even that uh, if I made it into an artwork, it probably would more, be more uh, possible that this would stay together at least. No? And that was what we did because nobody was taking care of this. And uh, I still today don't understand, you know, like, Berkeley, everybody was interested in, everybody actually knew about this collection, but nobody was trying to do an extra effort to keep these things together. Instead, there was like trying to get cheap paintings out of this poor lady that was 90 years old, you know, for free. But whatever, that's American uh, institutional politics, I guess. But so eventually you bought the archive from the mother and you made it into an artwork or, or is it, but did the authorship from the artwork had to come from you to match basically the economics of uh, museum acquisitions? Yeah, so I was very practical. I, you know, like, uh, and that's what I'm talking about, like to fill in great gaps. I think art should be used as a try and hold, you know, whenever it makes sense. And I thought that, look at this beautiful thing, you know, this is uh, his writing on it, and it's on Mother's Day, you know? So a little lady in, in his uh, hand, uh, what do you call it, like, uh, hand, what do you call it like this hand? Antonio, you're doing it. Uh, so so he, um, he writes, you know, to a little lady that always has her hands full. Okay, so good. Anyhow, so, um, so it was really like at that time I I was nominated I had won like the Hugo Boss Prize so I thought okay let's use the maximum impact you know? and uh, I told them then we just gonna display all these stuff and we through the institutional uh, exhibition can state it as an artwork and then we see like uh, if there's some um, uh, institutions that wants to take that responsibility. And uh, Walker did that. That's beautiful. I wish beautiful story. Like it should be, uh, I think it should have been Berkeley or, or New York institution, but uh, that didn't happen. Yeah. So. I think time wise, we are, it's uh, 7 p.m. in Europe, 1 p.m. in the US. And we promised also to take some questions from the audience. But before, I just want to read a, a quote from you that I thought really opens up a lot of, of, uh, of trigger points, you know, like, like in an acupuncturist mind, I think it's all about these trigger points that you touch. And I just want to read it uh, to close us a little bit our, our uh, conversation. So this is a quote from Jan Vo. I don't really believe in my own story, not as a single thing anyway. It weaves in and out of other people's private stories of local history and geopolitical history. I see myself like any other person as a container that has inherited these infinite traces of history without inheriting any direction. I try to compensate for this I'm trying to make sense out of it and I give it a direction for myself. That's a very old quote. 
would you correct it or enlarge no. it or shorten no. it? No, not at all. It's, uh, I think it's true. I still like, I don't know who I am today. You know? I think uh, for me, life is a, con a con continuous search of what, what all these kind of, what this messy life is about. It's a beautiful statement, thank you. So we get a, a question from Anonymous. When you were constantly traveling, how did you conceive of the relationship between the places your works are pointing to and the places where you were living? Did you intend for the works to have a link with the place you were in? Or did you find yourself working in a place without necessarily working with some element material or immaterial specific to that place yeah you know like i think uh, traveling was always a learning process for me but uh, and that i i you know like at the last major uh, places that i have traveled extensively to and lived in too was mexico and china no? but it was more um, um, I moved to Mexico and lived there for eight years uh, because I, when I started to travel in Mexico, I discovered my own Eurocentric upbringing. So it was not like to engage with Mexican culture. I was ever in the sense of, uh, of including it in, in my work. It was more to understand my own ignorance. You know, like I thought Tex-Mex was Mexican food, you know? And I didn't knew the difference between what Incas and Aztec was. And I was shocked about my own Eurocentric upbringing that we don't uh, learn about uh, Mexico in the sense that it was so important for Europe, right? So in, in many cases, when I, I get into a country or a places to, to discover, I, I try to understand my lack of knowledge more but not like to, to, to use the culture in, in the work. I, I think it's like in a way of, of understanding, yeah, you, the lack of your own knowledge. No? And I think that is the interesting thing. It's not like I was never like uh, uh, interested in anthropological, you know, research into other cultures. I think it, uh, I, I think it, it, um, it's, it has always been about my own Eurocentric upbringing and understanding that a little bit better. Thank you. The next question is from Tomo Usuda. Thank you for your insights, Jan. My name is Tomo, based in Hoi An, Vietnam. First, I'm curious to how you see the world today during a pandemic. Has it impacted your process of creativity? And if so, in what way? Yeah, no, I mean, I think that's, uh, I've been a very privileged person and uh, I, 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 you know, I travel a lot uh, during my career and, uh, and I, um, I know that it's a tragedy for a lot of people, for, but for, I, I, th I think it's in the way also like, uh, uh, a healthy break in this fast train that the uh, how the world have been running. You know? So, so I, I I tend to think that in all tragedies there's possibilities of changes, no? And changes are always good. Uh, and how I try to weigh it is like, do I want to see the world as it was before the pandemic? No? And I actually don't want to see the same world. So I hope that this pandemic can create this place into a place that's a little bit better than before. Uh, but uh, but I, uh, that's what I hope for, but let's see. Thank you. The second part, what does Vietnam mean to you now? And do you plan to create work there? Yeah, I, uh, I, uh, I, I, uh, I actually consciously in, for many years in, uh, in, uh, in, 
I, I didn't want it to exhibit in Vietnam because I, I was afraid of the trap that my, I mean, my, my work was already too unbalanced, defined as being related to Vietnam's history, which it is, but I think it's, you know, like much more the history of, of the Western world. No? And when I started to work with Marion Goodman, and we did like some some works related to 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 the history of the Vietnam War. I told her that this is a portrait of her, not me. You know, I missed it. I'm just a consequence of it. But a person like Marion Goodman has been living it, right? And I think that that um, that was very important for me. Uh, and. So uh, when I visited like the art scene in, in, in Vietnam, I, I, I was teaching more than I was doing exhibition because I think also I never was interested in, in I think like the art scenes in, in countries outside of the West, Western world should grow from within. You know? So I, I used to look at it a lot. And then I started to work in China and it took all my time. But, Thank uh, you. I miss Vietnam. Thank you very much. Jan, it has been a pleasure. Time passes way too fast. And, uh, and sorry for, uh, for creating some stress in the garden. To no, get no, you. no, no, no. It was just like, uh, yeah, my, my, my sense of schedule is like a little bit fucked up during these times. But we all made it, and I'm, I'm very grateful for this conversation, and I'm sure the public is too. And I want to thank all the people who stay with us for this hour. I want to thank Antonio for uh, his amazing work, and I want to thank also all my colleagues at the Hirshhorn who make uh, this live broadcast happen. I mean, we are, with the exception of the Sculpture Guard, the museum is closed. I mean, thanks God, we have the sculpture garden, which gives the, the opportunity for people in DC to be with art and to spend time with art and to see this plein air exhibition. But uh, I want to thank all of you and I wish you a good afternoon or a good evening, depending on where you are. Thank you very much and see you hopefully soon, Jan. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.